how to save 10 to 20 hours a week out of your time and, and 4x your income. Because a lot of people think, well, I, I don't want to give up 50% of my company or I don't want to give up 25% of my company. I want to do it all on my own. Um, that's the wrong mindset, yeah. right? Owner investors work on the business strategically. Owner managers work in the business tactically. So I, I just stood on my chair and I shouted out, said, hey, who knows the engineering automotive space? And Pete Cobain put his hand up. Those guys have now bought 17 different companies. One of the things when doing any type of deals at all is you've got to have a team. It's lonely on an island when you're successful, as well as you only have as much time in the day as you have. Who here actually does something full time? Raise your hand. The rest of you are retired? Part timers? Right? Besides investing full time in something else, how much time do you have in the day that you can actually put towards pursuing something bigger so you can stop punching a time clock, whether that's an owner job that you own, a business? or it's a job that you already have. Like who would love to learn more about time management and how you can fit in more time per day? The second thing is how can you leverage something bigger than yourself and have other people that have skills that you don't have do the work for you? Would you like to learn that? Yeah. All right, let's get a big clapping welcome for Carl Allen. Teamwork makes the dream work. Teamwork makes the dream work. So who wants to know how to save 10 to 20 hours a week out of your time and, and 4x your income? Who wants to learn that? Okay, so I learned this from one of my mentors, um, who is a very tall gentleman called Tony Robbins. Ever see the, um, have you seen the thing outside of me, the, the, um, the, the big, uh, whatever it's called, the poster of me? I'm six foot five on that poster, and I took a photograph of me, you might have seen it on Facebook, in front of that picture, and I, I put on there, I always wanted to be six feet five like Tony Robbins, and my wife replies to the comment, so did I. <laughs> so, um, so Tony Robbins taught me this, I was in his uh, Platinum Mastermind for a number of years, and uh, this is really, really cool. So, so this is all about building your team and time management, because you don't need to do this on your own. You might be thinking, wow, there's a whole bunch of stuff I need to do, I need to scour the market for deals. I need to go and talk to people. I'm going to have numbers I need to review. You don't need to do any of that stuff. You can be the coach of the team, the captain of the ship, and have loads of other people do the work for you. So what I want you to think about is you as like an LLC. So it's, um, it's Mark Call LLC. It's Brenda Poskett LLC. And you can build a team if you want to to do a lot of this work that needs to be done to get deals done. And there's five types of people that you can have on your team. And you can do this really small, or you can go full ball like I do and, and, and build a massive team. So a lot of the things that you need to do as a deal maker can actually be handled by VAs. So we'll talk about that. There's also professional advisors. So unless you're a lawyer or a CPA, you shouldn't transact your own deals. Once you buy a business, you sign an LOI, you've got a term sheet for whatever capital you need, and it's time to actually get the deal closed. You don't want to be doing that. It's boring. It's time consuming. You can have other people do that. We'll talk about that. Due diligence, closing, etc. I talked this morning about staying in your lane, right? And if you want to do a deal that's not in your lane, you might need somebody with that gray hair or that industry chops that can really add a lot of value both to the transaction and the business after you've bought it. So you might need a deal partner. Um, you might be struggling with accountability. I have a program called Protege, which is all about a community that holds people accountable. But we all need accountability in our lives. It's all about being able to show up to somebody and say, yeah, I did the things I said I was going to do and, and vice versa. And then often, and this is very common in the real estate market, is there are people that originate deals. They're called wholesalers. In the business acquisitions world, they're called bird dogs. It came from like the, the hunting and the shooting market that's over in the UK. So those are all the types of people that you can actually have. And, and virtual assistants, wow, um, amazing. The way VAs have kind of morphed over the last 10 years. VAs can play at all stages of your deal-making journey. So for example, you can have VAs help you with deal specification. 
So if you're thinking, well, you know, what are the hot markets right now? What are the markets that are growing? What are the markets that are not overly licensed? What are the markets where there's tons of deals? You can have a VA pull industry research and, and, and look at all that kind of stuff for you. So they, they can save you a ton of time helping you really define what your buy box is going to look like. You can also have VAs do a lot of deal origination. What you'll see this afternoon, Abraham is going to walk you through a lot of tactics around off-market deal origination. So building relationship networks, leveraging social media like LinkedIn, writing direct approach letters, even cold calling people. VAs can do most of that work for you. You can also have VAs with meetings. So unless you're traveling to meet somebody face-to-face, -face, um, which I always try and do, but if you're in Boston and you're looking to buy a company in LA, you're probably not going to go there until just before the closing. You're going to have those initial meetings, those initial conversations over Zoom. So your VA can help set those calls up. They can help you with research. They can take notes. Although there's a lot of like AI tools now, like Otter, which will come on and do it. But I always find when my VA is on the calls, uh, she knows exactly what are the key points I want to take. You can also have financial VAs. So don't just think of VAs as somebody in the Philippines that are managing your calendar and doing research. You can go on Upwork and hire financial professionals that will vet deals for you. They'll populate models. They'll look at financials. They'll prepare offers. They'll do all of that stuff. So VAs aren't just administrative. They can be people with, with some serious skills. Same with offers and negotiations. One of the things I do, and Abraham referenced it in the last presentation, is before I make any offer on any business, I create something called an offer sequencing stack. So I'll prepare my first offer. I'll have five more offers ready to roll out if I get counters from the seller. So I'm always three or four steps ahead. I don't do any of that shit. I have a team of VAs that do all of those different things. You can even have VAs help you with fundraising. One of the big roll-ups that I'm involved with at the moment. Um, I've hired um, some really, really savvy financial professionals who are out there just scouring all the family office uh, contacts and setting up meetings and, and doing all those really interesting things. Because when you're pitching investors, we'll get into this tomorrow, investors, there's really kind of four or five key things that investors look for in a deal, but they'll always focus individually on one thing. So if a VA is doing research for you, they'll help you profile what that investor really cares about so you can position your deal so you're hitting that mark uh, straight away. You can also have VAs helping you with, with deal execution, helping you kind of manage all the documents and managing a data room, which is where all the financials and documents go when you're closing a deal. And then also for closing, you can have a VA help you with a lot of that administrative stuff. And then once you own the business, and bearing in mind it's better to be an owner investor than an owner manager, you can rely on VAs and other resources to kind of help you manage and leverage your time. So professional advisors are really, really important in deals. As I said before, if you're not a lawyer or a CPA, don't even attempt to do that work. You want to hire the people that can come in. And, and what's great about professional advisors is most of the time they'll work on a contingency fee basis. So what does that mean, right? So what that means is you can have them work on the deal and you only pay them when the deal actually closes. So there's three things that you need to have in place for this to work. So the first thing is a solid relationship. So when you're going out doing deal origination, one of the first sets of people that you should be contacting are what I call deal intermediaries. So wealth managers, CPAs, attorneys, even investors and financiers, because they're gonna have off-market deal flow, right? They're gonna have deals or business owners in their pocket that they're potentially gonna serve up when you start to build a relationship. Do you know how easy it is to get a meeting with an attorney or a CPA? It's like the easiest thing in the world, because you send them an email on LinkedIn, you say, hey, you know, I'm Drew, I'm about to buy a business, here's my buy box, I'm looking for representation. What are they gonna say? No, I don't wanna to talk to you. They must hate money if they don't wanna to talk to you. So once you get on the phone with them, tell them what your buy box is all about, and they'll say, hey Drew, I've got this deal, it's off market, 
I think it's a perfect fit for your buy box. Do you want me to introduce you? Absolutely. So off-market deal flow, you're going to learn this this weekend, is the absolute holy grail of doing unbelievable deals. So once you've built a relationship with an attorney and a lawyer, a attorney or a CPA, keep them informed as you're going through and you're looking at deals. And then what you want to have as well is, and Abraham talked about it in his presentation, is one of the key milestones in any transaction is you sign something called an LOI, letter of intent. So once you sign that document, there's always a standard clause in that document that if the seller pulls out before closing, they have to pay you something called a breakup fee because an LOI gives you exclusivity to transact on that acquisition. It stops the seller going back out into the market and soliciting other offers. But if they do that and they breach that contract, then they have to pay you this breakup fee. So that's the second thing. And then if you're doing a deal that needs uh, a closing payment and you're going out and you're raising capital from investors, financiers, SBA, no matter who it is, they will have given you something called a term sheet, which is basically their LOI with you so that subject to their due diligence and their legals, you're going to be able to transact this deal and that money is going to flow through. So once you've got those three things, the solid relationship, the signed LOI for the business with the breakup fee, and then any funding term sheets that you need, nine times out of ten, a CPA and an attorney will transact that deal for you contingent, which means you've no money out of pocket for the closing, and then you pay them from the cash that's in the business once you buy it. Deal partners are really important. I labored on this this morning. Don't buy businesses that are not in your lane unless you can go and partner with somebody. They'll add value to the deal. They'll add value to the business once you've bought it. Imagine you're sat in a seller meeting and you're talking to the seller about their business and their industry. We've talked about rapport, building connections. If you have absolutely no idea how that business works, you've got no experience in that industry that you can share, then it's going to be a really tough conversation. So if you don't, if you find a deal and it's not in your lane, just go partner with somebody. If you're in the protege community, there are people partnering all the time because they're listening to this advice. Or if you're not in protege, go and find somebody on LinkedIn that you know, like, and trust that can add all this value for you. And these are a couple of guys that met at one of my events in the UK three, four years ago. Um, my, my hair was a little bit longer then. Who, uh, who had a radical haircut shift in COVID? So, you know, in COVID, they closed all the hair salons I did in the UK, and my hair got really unruly, so I, I buzz-cutted it, right? I had this buzz cut, and I thought, I really like it, so uh, I got long hair there. So I had this event pre-COVID, and there were two guys, um, both from the UK in my program. Uh, there was uh, Hanif in the middle and Peter. Peter was an engineer, and Hanif was a marketer and wanted to be a deal maker. And he came up to me at the lunch break. This was Hanif, and he said, hey, Carl, I, uh, I want to do this deal. It's in the engineering space. They make automotive components. It's a great deal, phenomenal cash flow. Uh, I can do the deal creatively, but I know nothing about the industry. So I, I just stood on my chair and I shouted out, said, hey, who knows the engineering automotive space? And Pete Cobain put his hand up. Those guys have now bought 17 different companies in a roll-up, and their cash flow in nearly 15 million pounds a year, so about $20 million a year. If they'd not have been in a room like this, and really kind of had the mindset shift around, let's partner. Because a lot of people think, well, I, I don't want to give up 50% of my company, or I don't want to give up 25% of my company. I want to do it all on my own. Um, that's the wrong mindset. That's the wrong mentality. One plus one equals three or more when it comes to deal making. You can do a lot more deals. You can learn from each other. You can brainstorm with each other. It's absolutely amazing when you get into this partnership mindset. You can share a lot of these complementary skill sets. One of you might be a really good kind of integrator or operator. So you're very good at tactical things, whereas other people could be very visionary, very strategic. So it's like me and Chris Moore, who's my partner in tons of different deals. He's a lot more of an integrator type mindset where I'm a visionary. Don't ever let me run a company. It will last five minutes because that's not my skill set. I'm all about creativity, big ideas, strategy, relationships, all those different things. I've done deals in industries I knew absolutely nothing about. But the first thing I did before I took the deal to that stage 
was go and find somebody that could do that for me. And if I couldn't find anybody, I'd go and find a business that was a competitor in that space, and I would merge that with the deal that I was doing, and I would make them the operator of running the business. And you can share all the work, you can share all the ownership. It's better to have 50% of something and know it's going to be successful than 100% of nothing because your lack of that industry knowledge couldn't get you across the finishing line. And this is another great example. So one of my, he's now a really good friend of mine, Chris Matthews, came into my protege program, started buying up uh, weight loss clinics. So has anyone ever remember the ad from the 80s with Victor Kayam? Remington Shaver, right? You know, the guy who said, I love the product so much, I bought the business. Well, this was Chris Matthews. He used to be a 450-pound guy. He was huge. He was like a whale, and he won't mind me saying that. And he went to one of these weight loss clinics where they, they put you on pure egg white protein diets. Uh, they have this fat-burning tool, which is non-invasive, which melts all your fat, and then skin tightening to give you the physique. So he went through that costs about $5,000 for 16 weeks, and he fell in love with the clinic, found out that the business owner was retiring, so he acquired it, and then he bought four or five more, and then he got to a place where he had an opportunity to go and buy the supplements company that was supplying all of his clinics. So he called me up one day, he said, hey, I think this deal's a little bit beyond me. Whilst I've done some deals and I know how to buy clinics, buying a supplements company, I owned a supplements company at the time. He knew I knew the industry. It's like, would you be my business partner and come in and help me do this deal? So that's what we did. So we became partners. Um, and we still are partners in this business today, which is absolutely amazing. So giving up some of your equity to get the job done is a massive mindset shift that, that you need to make. So with deal originations, you can use people to help you wholesale deals. Um, I'm going to show you some ways where you can wholesale deals and make a lot more. But if you're relying on people um, that are going to do deals for you, you can pay them a, a success fee once you've closed those deals. Because everyone's out there looking at deals, especially off market. And sometimes, you know, once you've figured out your buy box, Drew might have a buy box that's very specific, and he might look at 10 deals and, and eight of them uh, are not sufficient. For him to share them with Nathan and Mark and Brenda and everybody else, he can get either a piece of equity or a fee when, once those deals actually transact. So you've got to go through this mindset shift and think partnering can really help you elevate. It can really help you scale, and it can help you go much, much faster. And what it does, you know, when we talk about business ownership, I mentioned this morning that you can either work, you can either be an owner-investor or you can be an owner-manager, right? Owner-investors work on the business strategically. Owner-managers work in the business tactically. You can apply that same methodology to being a deal-maker. You can work on your deals versus working in your deals. If you're working in your deals, you're doing all the work. It will slow you down. You can only look at so many deals at once. We'll talk about time management in a minute. But working on your deal your buy box, building relationships, looking at capital providers, all the other stuff you can outsource to other people that are part of your team. So now let's talk about time management. So one of the biggest bullshit statements in the world today is, I don't have time. I don't have time for that. I don't have time. Of course you have time. It's what you do with that time, how you're efficient with that time that is going to make all the difference. So something I want you to do, obviously not now, is when you go back to wherever you're from, I want you to take a seven-day period, and I want you to do something called a time audit. Okay? If you're in any of my programs, you'll have done this before, or you should have done. So we all have 168 hours per week. We've all got the same amount of time, right? It's 24 hours a day, seven days. We've all got 168 hours. And then figure out what you do with that time. So we probably all sleep for 56 hours a week. We probably all work or do something significant like a W2 or, or something for 40 hours a week. We probably then spend, I'm guessing, three hours a day on average, 21 hours a week with family. So that's 117 hours of your week gone. You've now got 51 hours of time available 
to do stuff, like buying businesses. So the question I'm going to ask you, and do this when you get back over seven days, is I want you to figure out what are you doing with those other 51 hours. Some of you, there might be less because you might work 80 hours a week. Some of you, you might be a deal maker full time, so you're going to have a lot more time. So what I want you to do is just chart down. These are all the things that I did and do it in 30 minute increments. You can do this with your work activities. You can do this with any of the time that you're spending. And then what I want you to do then is I want you to put it into four buckets. So this is the Eisenhower matrix, if you've not seen this before. So you've got to put it into four buckets. So this was, before I did this, Tony Robbins had me do this. And before I did this, this was my, my time audit. This is about seven, eight years ago that I did this. So there are things we do in life or in work that we hate doing, but we do it anyway. There are things we do in life or in work that we can't do, or we do anyway. There are things we do in work or life that we shouldn't do, but we do anyway. And then there are things we do in life that we love doing, we're absolutely world class at it, and it will massively move the needle in that area of our life. So what the Eisenhower matrix does with the time audit is it aims to drive as much of your time and energy and focus into that top right quadrant, what Tony Robbins calls your zone of genius. So stuff that you hate doing, but you do it anyway. When I first started DealMaker, so before I met Chris, Chris, I used to manage all the freaking Facebook ads. What a, what, would a, what a disaster that would be if I did it now, right? Can you imagine that? I hated doing it, but I did it anyway because I had this stupid bullshit mindset that I am an entrepreneur and I should learn to do all this stuff. I had an insane budget to hire people, but I'm like, you know, I want to learn how to do it. I hated it, but I did it anyway. Stuff that you can't do, but do anyway. Did you know, Chris, the very first website, who, um, who's been following me since back in the Ninja Acquisition days? So way before DealMaker. So I built the first ever Ninja Acquisitions website. I'm looking at two technology guys here, so you're thinking, yeah, so suck it up. But... I know nothing about technology. I'm the most technology terrible person in the world, but I thought, I want to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs do that kind of stuff. I built all my furniture when I set that company up, and I built my own freaking website. How stupid was that? But it worked. It was amazing. But stuff that I couldn't do but learned to do it anyway, and then stuff that you shouldn't do, and I still do this today. I'm crazy. I love booking my own travel. I'm really fussy about which airline and... You know, can I get a direct flight? What time do I have to get up? You know, I have all these assistants, but I just love bucking my own travel. So that's stuff that if you hate doing it, you can't do it, or you shouldn't be doing it, don't do it. Do the things that you love, you're amazing at, and are massively going to move the needle. So once you do that time audit, what's going to happen is you're going to change something called your EHR, which stands for your effective hourly rate. So your effective hourly rate is dead easy math. Calculate how much money you make in a week. Let's say you make $2,000 a week, 100 grand a year, and you spend 50 hours doing it as part of your time audit. You divide 15 to 2,000, it's 40 bucks an hour, right? So you're making 40 bucks an hour, right? So you can outsource most things for less than 40 bucks an hour to free you up to do other things. So again, if you delegate, you delete, and you outsource, you can stop doing those things that you can't do. You can stop doing those things that you shouldn't do. And you can stop doing those things that you don't want to do. So this was my change after I went through this process. The amount of stuff that I was hating to do drastically fell. The amount of stuff that I couldn't do drastically fell and the amount of stuff that I shouldn't do drastically fell, and it put not only a lot more time in my zone of genius, so a 3x improvement, but it also saved me 10 hours of free time to take up other activities and spend more time with my family and travel a lot more. And then what happens is you can have a new effective hourly rate. So now you're making $6,000 a week because you've 3x'd your focus time on the really needle-moving stuff. You've spent 30 hours doing it instead of 40, so now your effective hourly rate is $200 an hour, which is a four times increase or a five times increase on what it was before. 
So my effective hourly rate today is 1,000 bucks an hour. I won't do anything that I'm not going to get paid $1,000 an hour. I would rather outsource it to somebody else. Even if they're going to charge me 500 bucks an hour, I don't care because I know that when I'm focused in my zone of genius, I can make 1,000 or 10,000 or even $100,000 an hour doing that super creative deal-making stuff. So I hope that was really, really useful. Please do that time audit. Uh, you'll find it so massively powerful and mindset changing. And again, don't be afraid to partner with people that can really help you accelerate and plug some of the skill gaps that you might have. Thank you, guys. Hey guys, I'm Carl Allen. I'm the founder of Dealmaker Wealth Society. I've done tens of billions of dollars of deals over the last 30 plus years. If you're new to my channel, definitely hit like and subscribe so that you can get all of my amazing Dealmaker content in real time. You're not gonna miss any of the outstanding information that I'm gonna share with you. And if there's a question that you've got, if there's something that you want to know the answer for and you want me to speak to it, definitely hit me up in the comment section and I will record those videos for you and I will get them on this channel as soon as possible. So love having you part of this YouTube community and I can't wait to serve you. Until then, bye bye for now.